Hey, what's up, all you cool cats and kittens? Uh, this is the last week coming to kick things off with that intro, but what's going on, everybody? It is your boy, Crypto Bobby. I hope you're having a great day, great night, wherever you're watching or listening in from. Joined today, as always, by my co-host, Colton. What's up, brother? What's going on, Rob? How are you? Uh, just enjoying life in the in the Caribbean. I've escaped quarantine. Uh, I have beautiful... You know, beautiful waves behind me. It's it's a good time to good time to be alive in the in the world. <laughs> and by that, I'm just an idiot playing around with Zoom backgrounds. So I, I'll probably change this now because it's it's actually annoying me a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, I chose outer space because I figured I'd be a little bit more calm up here. Um, but still feeling the effects of the coronavirus. So I think I'm gonna bring it back to Earth. <laughs> yeah. Now I <laughs> I def- definitely hear you on that. And. Uh, we got a good amount to cover. News in in the crypto world right now, like crypto specific news, is is actually a little bit slow, which is kind of interesting. I feel like there's a little bit of a lull. Like if you look at CoinDesk, you look at the block, you will you look at any of these crypto news sites right now. There's not a ton of of like really crypto specific stuff. It seems to be a little bit of a quiet period. But when you look at the global picture of everything that's happening, it's just information overload right now. Uh, you know, when it comes down to coronavirus stuff, when it comes down to just like the regular markets, uh, it is, it's a, it's a wild time. Yeah. I, it's kind of nice, you know, Bitcoin might be on the the back burner for, for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks with everything else going on. Um, you know, but with that being said, um, if you've been paying attention the last month, we're almost a month from, the fateful March 12th drop down to 3,800. And uh, I don't know, Rob, was that, was that the generational bottom here? I, I still have a tough time believing that. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily for Bitcoin, like for, for the traditional markets. And this is something that I think, you know, we could definitely touch on too. But like right now, I, I don't know. I want to say somebody put out a tweet that it's like the, uh, a number of indexes are up like, 40% from, they, they basically bounced. Uh, I think it was like 40% from, from the lows already. They're still nowhere near all time highs, mm-hmm. but you're starting to see just this like overall disbelief in the traditional markets. And for the time being, at least Bitcoin is, is still in, in the crypto markets at large are still kind of following uh, what's happening in the traditional markets. And you've seen a just a pretty strong bounce back of of stocks and global equities and things like that. And there isn't much good news. I, I mean, there are some places where it looks like the 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 infamous phrase like flatten the curve. Now, some places look like they're they're starting to let up steam a little bit. Um, Italy looks like it's kind of seen the light at the end of the tunnel. You have Wuhan, the place where it all initiated, um, is is now out of of lockdown. So you're starting to see like a light at the end of the tunnel in some places, but I'm in New York and New York from where I'm sitting in my apartment, it's not bad. But when you look in the news, like it looks like all hell is breaking loose and it's, it's tough to, to see the one aspect of news and then also see like stocks bouncing back. And a lot of people I think either went short and are just pissed off about it, or Mm -hmm. they just like can't comprehend that, reality is just completely disconnected from what is <laughs> basically happening in the equities markets. Yeah, I mean, mega bounce for tons of uh, the equity markets and Bitcoin. Um, there's no question a correlation you know, in price when you put the, the price action side by side um, for the short term. It's definitely, there's definitely a correlation there, no question. Um, but yeah, I was, I was um, talking to someone the other day where, you know, we're kind of, soon to be out of the frying pan into the fire, in my opinion, where we, you know, hopefully the virus um, is, is taken care of in the next couple of weeks, uh, maybe, maybe short months. Um, but I think when it comes to the overall economy, I mean, everyone on the planet basically stopped working and producing things and, and, and spending money for the mm. last month or two. And I don't think that's a, you know, a, a positive thing uh, yeah i don't think it's something no. that's going to be fixed in a quarter or two um you know i i try to i want to be optimistic i really hope that it, this isn't some prolonged um multi-year downturn but it's just hard not to to um picture that and 
at the very least, you got to prepare for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I think you're starting to see like numbers come out too, where it's a third of people have not paid April rent yet. And it sounds really bad and it is, but when the, the number typically I think is at like 80 something, 81 between like 85 and 81% typically. So first of all, crazy that like 20% of people typically <laughs> don't pay their rent, but yeah, who are those we've people? already seen like a 17% drop on top of that. And I don't think, you know, you're start like that was one month of a, or even in a lot of situations, less than a month of yeah. kind of economic effect that we've seen from basically having to shut down, you know, restaurants not open, bars not open, travel done, tourism done, hospitality done. Um, I feel really lucky personally to be able to work from a job where I can work remote in my apartment, but there's a ton of people that aren't like that. And there's a huge population of the country that basically lives paycheck to paycheck. And I think you're going to see that part of just the country really, unfortunately, hit hard by this until we can figure out how to get people back to work. But yeah, that's kind of crazy, too, when you think about all that stuff and then you look at stocks going higher, Bitcoin, which has been correlated kind of to... Uh, there's so much arguments about the correlation <laughs> between Bitcoin and, and stocks. And long term, I, I don't necessarily think that that's always going to be the case. But for, for now, it just feels like it's and it looks like it's trading pretty tightly. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, short term, it's it's important, I think, to keep um, the perspective and look at the, the medium to even long term, um, you know, when it comes to just investing in Bitcoin in general. Um, you know, so that's one piece of it. And, and going back to what you said with people not being able to pay rent, I mean, companies can't pay rent. Yeah. I mean, uh, and companies don't have the cash, um, to pay, like, for example, we were talking about, we work, yeah. we work, they literally don't have the cash, uh, to pay rent for the places that they, uh, rent out to others. So, uh, they're in a pretty bad position. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that's something too, like going in the crypto world. And so uh, PwC, which is a uh, you know, big four accounting firm, they put out a uh, report on crypto M&A for like going into 2020. Pretty detailed report. I'll put a link in the YouTube and podcast description. They had some good trends to watch and things like that, like a 20 page kind of PowerPoint report. Um, if you're interested in the space, I would definitely recommend taking a look at it. But one of the big takeaways, they, they had three trends to watch in 2020. One of them is, is the crypto industry is not immune to the global macroeconomic conditions, which I somewhat agree with. I, I also think the crypto industry so far, and this is also like with a big grain of salt, so far has been relatively shielded from what we've seen, uh, you know, I guess globally, like Colton and I, we, you know, we're, we're working on recruiting in the space and there are a lot of companies that are still hiring and adding talent. Whereas you're seeing, whether it's in tech startup land or in a lot of other industries, you're seeing, you know, companies just getting hammered with layoffs and, and really pulling back. Um, so I, I don't think that the crypto industry at, 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 as a, like is totally immune, but it's more immune than most places from the current economic conditions. But what the second trend, and I think kind of something that's interesting going into that is they talk about further consolidation taking place in 2020. And we talked about it a little bit last week with Binance buying coin market cap. But I think when you look at the players in the space, cash really is, is king. And the companies that, that do have cash you know, on the balance sheet, the companies that actually generate revenue versus the ones that do not are going to be in a really, I think, strong place to potentially scoop up talent and, and companies. And there are going to be other organizations out there. There are going to be other firms out there that are going to struggle. We saw it earlier this week. I don't know, Colton, if you saw Factum. Um, they are really like early stage token sale. Like I think one of the first ICOs mm -hmm. ever, um, like over, I think like five plus years ago, they only raised like $200,000. Um, but they had a token that was worth over a hundred million bucks at one point in time. Uh, and they had to shut, uh, shut down shop, um, just cause they, you know, couldn't kind of couldn't get more, more funding and didn't really have a way to earn revenue. And I think you're going to start to see 
consolidation at the top where you have these mm -hmm. big companies like Binance and Coinbase and Kraken and that type of thing have a bunch of cash because they're actually making money and they can kind of sit back and say, okay, you know, these, these folks are struggling. Maybe we scoop them up for talent in like an aqua hire type scenario. Yeah. And the companies you just named, you know, Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, what are they? They're exchanges and exchanges are the ones that have the cash. Um, you know, the industry is still very speculative, um, very um, trade heavy. You know, people love to trade um, and over leverage. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, but I think it's uh, important to note these these are the companies that have the power right now when it comes to cash. And so what are they going to do? They're going to um, find the companies that that um, have good products uh, and good teams and scoop them up. They're also going to pick off the the good talent that's out there right now. Tons of layoffs across the board. Uh, and they're going to have the pick of the litter, uh, for, for lack of a better term. You know, they're going to be able to find top talent, hire them, bring them onto their teams, um, and, uh, you know, they're going to produce. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch, especially on the talent side, because traditionally in, in the job market over the past, like, 10 years for for anybody who has kind of been interviewing or anything like that, you know, unemployment has been incredibly low. Uh, what a 3% or something like that unemployment. But if you look at like in, in the, the tech industry in particular, like unemployment was basically at zero for the most part when you had skilled tech workers and you're starting to see um, tech workers, whether they're engineers or just people like non-technical people in the industry, you're starting to see layoffs hit these Silicon Valley startups that raised hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars, basically like that have raised a ton of money. And for really like 10 plus years, you've, you've thought about startups, but you haven't thought about them necessarily like as a risky place to work because for the most part, things have always been fine with those, mm -hmm. with those companies. It's kind of been business as usual. And this is the first time I think in, in a long time where, you start to look proud and candidates are starting to look at some of these tech startups and think like, okay, maybe there actually is some career risk there for me. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see that develop. Um, you, most people are like yeah, seed round series a really are, are the highest risk. And even in those situations, uh, if you're the executive team of an early stage startup, you know, for example, in SAS, um, you know, or computer software, they, um, you can usually find someone to, to, to buy you out, you know, at that early stage, at, at least in a good economy. That's what we've mm -hmm. seen in the last decade. You're usually able to find somebody to scoop you up. Um, but now not so much people when it comes to investing and these mergers and acquisitions are a little bit more selective. Yeah, totally. And one, one trend I think that's, that's kind of interesting to watch right now. And, and speaking of, of maybe falls from grace a little bit. But BitMEX, there has just been like a growing, I don't want to say concern, but kind of concern and, and growing outrage. And, and BitMEX always has its fair share of outrage. There's always one thing or another and, uh, you know, one reason or another that people are, are mad about BitMEX. But it is almost uh, a month or so ago now from kind of the infamous March 12th time frame where the traditional markets shit the bed. Bitcoin shit the bed and a lot of that occurred or is, you know, has been, or in retrospect has been blamed, uh, on BitMEX and people have talked about, you know, a $20 million sell order basically would have taken Bitcoin to zero on BitMEX. And there is, there, there's been a, a lot of growing discord about just unsatisfaction, you know, dissatisfaction with Bitcoin or with BitMEX in particular. And there's some research recently talking about BitMEX actually losing dominance in volume to a number of different exchanges. And it's it'll be it'll be rather interesting on, on my end to watch exactly how this plays out because I do think traders in the space, while there is a little bit of brand loyalty, uh, people can be pretty fickle. And BitMEX has had a, I think, a really good grasp on the industry as far as like from a volume standpoint if you're trading there you know the the btc yeah. or the excuse me the xbt perp swap that they have they they've since you know late i would say like late 2017 till now they've really been crushing it and now you're starting to see some increased competition and for the most part when you look at the crypto world 
the people that stay on top don't stay on top for that that long right yeah i mean watching this play out i mean do you think that they handled it correctly thus far so i think there there could probably and i don't maybe want to say probably um i think that they could definitely handle things better and finance and cz they you know they get into they they have their fair share of of getting basically anybody in the crypto world that runs an exchange gets ripped apart for something or another but when something goes wrong with with Binance, CZ has a tendency to to jump out in front of it, really kind of over communicate. Mm -hmm. And I do think that his ability to do that has saved them from sketchy situations in the past, like the Binance hack. I mean, they, they got hacked for I don't remember what it was now, but it was like what between like 20 and 50 million dollars. There's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and people just forget that because of the way CZ was like, all right, you know, we're going to eat the loss and we're going to move on. And, you know, that's our bad. And, you know, just over communicated it. Whereas there was a tweet and this was on March 15th. And I don't think Arthur has said much since, but he basically just said, I know there are questions and concerns following the events from the past 72 hours. We've been listening and my team has been gathering the facts. We'll be addressing these questions and concerns transparently and comprehensively comprehensively over the coming days and there was really no strong mm -hmm. um there was just no strong basically set of information there was one follow-up tweet that said on you know, march 13th we came under attack from a botnet that had been probing the system and that was about it there was no real strong just kind of like response bitmax itself put out a blog about a ddos attack and uh Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought that just overall the response maybe left a little bit to be desired from some people. And you started to see some people talk about moving away from moving away from BitMEX. And anytime yeah. you see people talking about moving away from BitMEX, the one thing I would say, and I don't have a vested interest one way or another, but especially on Twitter, if it's somebody that is an investor in one of these exchanges, which a lot of the big, you know, big people in the space, whether it's know a Deribit or a Bybit or whatever it's like are they an investor in the space or in the exchange are they showing a ref link um, <laughs> or do they have some type of or are they like an unbiased party and that's something you always want to take into consideration too and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit but always always try to just see where somebody's coming from in these situations as well yeah reputation is everything especially in such an, an industry that's so small um, and I think you made a good point there with CZ usually jumping out at, in front of these issues. He does a great job there because um, there's things you just can't avoid. So getting in front of it is probably the best the best action to take. So hopefully BitMEX, I don't know if it's too late, but hopefully they, they provide some context and some color there. But uh, we'll see. I think uh, traders you know, that, that were loyal to BitMEX, they may be looking elsewhere. It's liquidity wins at the end of the day. And if you can, if you're a big whale and you've got a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, Bitcoin to trade, you know, you're going to, you're going to find the liquidity pools that suit you best. Uh, so maybe BitMEX uh, a year from now, uh, who knows, maybe it doesn't exist. <laughs> I would, uh, I mean, that'd be crazy. <laughs> I, I would have a hard time that happens outside of some type of regulatory action yeah. just because it's such a cash cow. So I, who who knows? I I would just like you know if I'm Arthur, I'm holding on to that baby for everything I oh, have, yeah. because yeah. I mean that is that's that's your cash cow, and that thing is a literal like people talk about like money printer go burr, like Bitmax <laughs> profits go burr. Yeah. So <laughs> that's it's definitely you know I'm I'm trying to keep that going as much as possible, but also when you think about it too, there have been a lot of exchanges that have you know really fallen from grace, and whether it's been. Now, from the early days, it was more on the sketchy side or just overall management and competence. You have the mm -hmm. the Mount Goxes or the Cripsies of the world super early on. But then even, too, you have companies like Poloniex and Bitrex that were super popular in 2017. But for you know, one reason or another, one just executive misstep or another, they're a shadow of what they once were. And you've had... Companies like Binance and BitMEX kind of come out of that 2017 uh, just bubble and be able to maintain and, and kind of build on that. I think, you know, Binance and BitMEX have both 
gotten to the top spot in their respective areas and mm-hmm. kind of held on to it. And it'll be somewhat fascinating to watch how long that they can do that. And BitMEX itself is starting to show some some cracks in the foundation. Binance, while people like to give Binance shit for one reason or another, they continually add products. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. they're continually they just... scaling things. Mm-hmm. So. I know. They keep pushing out new products uh, and people... They like the UI uh, and the the UX. It's 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 pretty. It's sleek. It works, um, and it's reliable for the most part. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's going to win um, the hearts of the users. So um, it'll be see it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And going into going into the just like next episode conversation too. So we had some segments last week, and we'll definitely talk about some some more of those. But one new segment and. I don't know if anybody out here listens to to pardon my take, but uh, they have a they have a segment just hot seat cool throne, and we have pump it dump it because it's it's crypto <laughs> and uh, you know got to talk about things that are on the way up and on the way down. So would love to hear in the YouTube comments too your thoughts after after you know listen to this around Twitter on on pump it dump it, but uh, to to pump it this week. And and just the past like three weeks for me in particular on the pump it side of the house, I started quarantine thinking, all right, you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be healthy. I'm going to you know I'm gonna be <laughs> stuck in the house, but like you know I'm just gonna be disciplined. I'm gonna work out, and I was actually pretty disciplined beforehand. I was going to the gym six uh, five like five days a week, eating pretty healthy, doing you know, doing all that stuff, not drinking all that much. Now I'm just like five days a week instead of going to the gym drinking booze so pump it right now is just my alcohol consumption i've been seeing it some tweets from you you know you're making different drinks every night i I don't know i mean i'm a little worried master class on bartending (laughs) and i i don't have a picture of it but i have ordered drizzly so for those of you who aren't in like a big city or don't have drizzly it's like literally just an alcohol delivery service it's just local liquor stores they deliver to your door Still delivering in quarantine. So wow. got vodka, got gin, got whiskey, got mezcal, got light rum, got dark rum, got Kahlua. So I'm I'm making everything under the sun right now when it comes to booze. And that's just my pump. It is just my alcohol consumption is absolutely pumping right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's only, it's only after work, though. Right, right. Not during working hours. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would have to say, I mean, uh, my what's pumping right now for me is is my my twitter usage um is pumping it's pumping hard and i'm not proud of it but it's true <laughs> i mean and, and i don't know if you have an you have an iphone yes yeah i don't want to look at screen time yeah yeah no, not only does it tell me my weekly screen time uh you know hours per day and down to the minutes it also tells me which apps i use the most and week after week twitter is twitter. just above <laughs> And beyond at the time. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not proud. Of, I'm not going to share my numbers, but uh, yeah, not proud of that. <laughs> Twitter's Twitter's great. And I love Twitter more than anything. And I've like posted, uh, God knows how many tens of thousands of tweets probably and how much screen time and how many hours of my life I've wasted on it. But especially like right now, like Twitter is always like poison <laughs> basically. <laughs> but yeah. like right now, especially like Twitter yeah. is just like, I have to really remove myself because in the past month to two months, people are just absolutely freaking out and going ape shit about coronavirus and politics. And it is just like, there is, there's like productivity on one side of the, you know, on one side, it's like the, the angel and the devil. It's like, Hey, be productive over here. Like do, do things that'll actually matter. And then like the devil on the other shoulder is like, Hey, you know what? Go scroll through Twitter and watch people freaking out about COVID-19 and just let yeah. your entire day go by through like panic and, and just being overwhelmed. And it's like, all right, should probably not do that. Yeah. And, and to defend ourselves a little bit, uh, there are some, you know, Twitter is valuable when it comes <laughs> it to, oh, uh, you know, of course it's valuable. I told myself that. Yeah. Waste time. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, uh, there's lots of different things you can learn from, from uh, the folks on Twitter. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it helps me get through with, with just the memes and, and the ability for me to, totally. to end my day with some good high quality memes. So, uh, you know, that's pumping for me for sure. 
And uh, on on the dump it side, I'll let you I'll let you start it first. Do you have anything on uh, on what you're dumping during this uh, during this time? Yeah. Well, what is dumping right now? I mean, handshakes. Handshakes are dumping hard. Uh, handshakes are going to zero. You know, I mean, and I'm 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 not a I'm, I'm not opti- a handshake hater. There's no there I'm is... optimistic. I I want handshakes to come back. I mean, I love a good firm handshake. Give me give me a firm know? handshake and don't be a little bitch about it. Right, right. But <laughs> I think people are gonna. It's gonna be so awkward the first time people like interact with each other again. And, and a handshake opportunity like comes up and they both just kind of look at each other and they're like, wait, sh- should we do this? Like we just had this whole <laughs> coronavirus thing and it, you know, I wonder, is it gonna, you know, are the handshakes gonna dump? Yeah. I mean, you lot speaking of Twitter, lots of pontificating <laughs> on Twitter about oh, yeah. whether or not handshakes are ever going to come back. And a lot of people declaring the handshake dead, um, and and as as a, a fake man's man here, I, I don't want the handshake to die, but it is what it is. Uh, um, and, and on my on <laughs> what my about dump you? it <laughs> on on my dump it this week, um, I'm dumping Dudex, <laughs> and I uh, <laughs> it, this is this is unconfirmed rumors, but the official uh, Dudex chairman of of the world uh the man the myth the legend on twitter bitlord who um i i find hysterical i don't know if he's trolling half the time i don't know if he's not i i can't tell the seriousness of his tweets but he uh bitlord is bitlord's a legend and uh was (laughs) very much i think bitlord is basically the only reason anybody knows what dudex is um and so he's kind of sounding the alarm. He was, I think, like their main affiliate, basically. And if you don't know what Dudex is, hopefully that just means you weren't on Twitter and getting murdered with ref links for like, uh, I don't know how many months in the fall of 20, 2019. But uh, when you when you go back and look at it, I think, number one, it was super blatantly obvious back then. Anytime you're just getting spammed with ref links, it's a good good thing to maybe look in the mirror and be like, hey, why... Why is this company spamming me with, or why why is everybody spamming me with ref links? Uh, also reminded me heavily of of Bxe or Bxe or whatever the hell exchange that, that was. Yeah, Bxe. Uh, lots of ref links. Lots of ref links. So many. Um, but uh, yeah, so Dudex is is apparently in a little bit of uh, hot water with their their main uh, affiliates, uh, Bitlord, uh, my man, uh, Crypto, or excuse me, Korean Jew. Uh, Mm -hmm. also said he was having some trouble with them. So I think the, I mean, the one, one just overall lesson is anytime you're just getting hit with a bunch of ref links, take a step back and and make sure that the exchanges is actually, actually, actually legit. And then also I am not a marketer, but a hot tip for these marketing firms, you know, for these companies out there, there's like, I don't know. 50,000 people on, on like, and that's probably super generous, but there's not that many people on crypto Twitter right now. And there are like all these exchanges that think they're just going to create a ref link and, and spam like the 5,000 people that are on that and are going to find their way to the promised lands with that. There's, there's gotta be a better strategy. Uh, there's gotta be a better strategy. Yeah. I, I don't know if it'll ever go away. It's in times of like, pandemonium when price is pumping like ref links just get shielded nonstop. like in 2017 ref links everywhere all the time so i mean i don't think they'll ever go away but uh it's like you said it's probably a good idea to look in the mirror if if you know you, you find yourself getting surrounded by ref links to to question what's going on a little bit yeah totally and uh you know one one kind of last segment we can just finish off here, and we talked about it last time, but obviously, you know, we're both on the in the in the recruiting game. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't know, I run Proof of Talent. Colton is the senior recruiter at Proof of Talent, so Colton spends all day talking to candidates. I spend all day talking to candidates and hiring companies. And for anybody that's been you know laid off or is is thinking about uh you know interviewing or is interviewing actively interviewing right now i want to want to leave things off with a, a job interview tip for you and just give you you know something to, to think about a little bit if you you know are going through the job interview process 
and and one thing that just kind of comes up to mind for for me in particular is the you know relative importance of just sending a thank you email after you have a conversation with somebody um it's huge it's there are so many like low effort things you can do and like last week we talked about a couple of diff- different of those of those things that you could do that were relatively low effort and i think that's kind of the 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 stance I, I certainly take when it comes down to just increasing your chances. Like what are the little things that you can do that don't require all that much? There's not a big excuse not to do it. And sending a thank you note after you talk to somebody, I think it's just one of those things. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and it's easy to forget that one. Thank you notes uh, are key. Um, and I don't think everybody on like the thank you note side of the house, I don't think everybody does them either. Right. I agree. Um, I would say my, my job interview tip for the week is, um, when you're, you're closing pitch, you're closing pitch at the end of your, your interview, or a lot of the times before the question piece, uh, before the, the hiring manager asks you, Hey, what questions you have when you're wrapping up, um, you know, selling yourself for back of a lack of a better term, um, tell them why you want the job, you know, prepare a pretty solid closing pitch, and you know, two or three sentences it doesn't have to be a lot, but I'd memorize this. I would have this one like down pat practice this one. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to memorize your whole uh, spiel about your backgrounds and, and all that stuff. You don't want to sound rehearsed, but I think this closing pitch, this is the last thing they're going to hear. It's really important to make this clear and concise. And so definitely prepare that ahead of time, memorize it, make it short and sweet. Yeah. And I I think that's just like going off that too. Like that's the one thing I don't think people always realize when it comes down to interviewing, but when you are interviewing, you're most likely not the only person interviewing for a position. So you have to think, okay, I'm competing with, maybe it's one other person, maybe it's five other people, but you need to always think about how can I position myself to be the best candidate and how can I basically sell myself to be the person that they want to hire. So think about what that sales pitch is for you and trying to establish that like Colton said up front so that you're always kind of positioning yourself as that go-to person that they want to bring on board because whether or not you know the, you're you're not gonna know really who you're quote unquote competing against, but you're most likely competing against somebody else and they're gonna be at the end of the interview stage and say, you know, Rob had X, Y, Z experience. This person had this experience like, which one is better maybe for more value, et cetera. So it's important to just think about that in the long term. Yeah. Have your, have your, your drop the mic moment, you know, have that where you feel like when they think about, okay, how did Rob do? How did Colton do? We're comparing these uh, two candidates. Rob interviewed like shit. Oh yeah. And Colton just dropped a bomb closing statement, drop the mic, you know, that's what they're going to remember. So I think those are the key things that you can take away for, uh, for this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and hopefully that was helpful. And if you guys have questions too ever about just like job interviews or crypto specific recruiting stuff, definitely let us know. Um, I'm on Twitter, obviously. Colton's on Twitter, just past the big 400 follower mark. Huge. So not, Huge. not following Colton on Twitter. Do it. Otherwise, I'll find you and, and I'll make you, but do it. Yeah. Um, and if you're enjoying this on YouTube, make sure to uh, just comment below. You know, Let us know if you have any questions, thoughts. Always love interacting in the comments. Make sure to hit that thumbs up, like button. And uh, if you're listening on the podcast, thanks as always. Make sure to pop by, say hi to us on Twitter. But looking forward to seeing you next week as well with another episode. Have a good one, everybody. See you guys. See you next week.